get started. So it's really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Luna Nam, appearing under a new title for the first time. So this morning she did a beautiful job defending her thesis, and right now she will give us the uh, more general version for, for all of us to enjoy. And uh, just so that for those of you who are, are not aware, um, we will have a celebration afterwards, and then we'll, we'll have, I'll have a little bit more time to uh, to make a toast to Munan. So please join us after the talk um, for, for a little bit of a celebration. Take it away, Munan. Hey, okay, thank you everyone for coming. And um, today I'll be talking about my PhD thesis on the star, uh, simulated star formation, sorry, simulated chemistry, star forming environments, and working with Eve. And thank you, Eve, for your very kind introduction. It was a pleasure for, to work with you for my thesis. Um, so let's get started. And also, yeah, I forgot that I put Chinese subtitle for my family, and some other people here might understood whether I did a good job or not. Um, so don't be surprised if you see some fancy characters at top. Um, so this talk is really half two parts. So what part one? Um, is about a simple and accurate chemistry network that we proposed for simulating hydrogen and carbon chemistry in the star forming environments and in the ISM. And the second part is um, to apply this chemical network to study the um, interstellar medium and specifically the concealed axial conversion factor in galactic multi-phase ISM simulations. And I'll try to explain a little bit more about what these words mean. So let's start with the first part. Um, why do we want to study chemistry? Because um, after all, we are the astrophysics department. Um, I think a good answer for it is because chemistry makes um, things colorful. What do I mean? Um, this is a large Magellanic cloud, a famous galaxy in the southern atmosphere that you might have seen before in pictures. Um, it's black and white without chemistry, but if you add chemistry, then now you have colors. So the different chemical species um, are tracing different phase of the ISM. So for example, the blue part um, shows the ionized hydrogen, H2, um, that is hot and um, very diffuse. The red part shows the atomic gas in our galaxy. And finally, the um, yellow part shows the um, molecular gas in our galaxy. They're much more clumpier because they're very, very cold and very, very dense. And these regions are where the stars form, so we're going to uh, focus today on the row of um, CO or H2, and this is the dense gas in the galaxy for star formation. And these di different chemical species uh, provide observational tracers for the ISM, and also they're agents for heating and cooling of the interstellar medium. And this is one of the most famous uh, relations for the star formation that is very commonly shown um, in any sort of star formation talk. So what this plot is showing is that if we look at the star formation uh, environment in our galaxy, we find that the surface density of H2 on the x-axis and the star formation rate on the y-axis has a linear relation, and every dot is um, sort of observation point for Clouds in, for clouds in our galaxy or in other galaxies. Um, and this means that there is sort of a constant depletion time scale, which is the slope, the slope of 2 giga years. Um, however, I want to note that neither the x-axis or the y-axis are directly observable. Um, the star formation rate is derived from UV and infrared right, red radiation from the massive stars that's forming. And the x-axis, the surface density of H2, it's actually derived from CO. Because it turns out it's very hard to measure the H2 because it does not emit at very low temperatures. Um, I think it's a really great time to study the chemistry because now we have um, our observation and simulation at a similar scale and um, so that we could actually start to compare the observations and simulations very well. So on the left here, I'm showing a simulation of a piece of the galaxy, and this is a density plot showing that there's a lot of turbulent um, multi-phase gas in our galaxy. And on the right plot here, I'm showing the um, molecular cloud 
Scott's survey, um, this observations of, of a big piece of our galaxy as well, with similar scale um, as the simulations and similar resolution as the simulations. So in order to actually compare our theoretical model and our observations, uh, we need to have both the chemistry and synthetic observations to actually directly link our theoretical model to the observable quantities. Um, however, it turns out it's actually quite challenging to simulate CO formation. So in your kitchen, you'll be very familiar with the reaction if you burn some carbon hydrates, like your stove gas, uh, with oxygen, you form some CO. Um, if you don't burn it completely, and then it's poisonous and you don't like it. Um, but in the ISM, the formation is much more complicated. It's because if you put the carbon and oxygen atoms together, um, the ISM is very cold, um, it's not very dense, and the collisional rate is so low that the direct reaction rate is very, very low. So in order to form CO, you have to either rely on ions, which will increase the cross-section, or rely on dust grains, which um, act like, um, like a sticking agent for the atoms to come in together. So then you can form CO in the end. This is why in the ISM, the CO formation is very, very complicated. So you have a network of tens of species and hundreds of reactions to actually simulate the chemistry in the ISM. And we don't like this because it's really uh, computationally expensive if you want to calculate this in a large scale simulation. So what we would want to do is to simplify the chemistry network in the simulations. Um, and we uh, did this based on the previous people's previous work. Um, one method to do it is to group a couple of reactions and species together to form a pseudo reaction and species group. Um, this, is a, this is a method that introduced by Nelson Langer in 1999. Another thing to uh, simplify the chemistry is to take out what you don't actually need that don't directly uh, affect the CO formation. And then we found other reactions that are not included in the previous work of others are also very important for CO formation and um, the chemical composition, molecular gas, for example, the reactions of dust grains. So we are the first ones to actually compare the detailed results of a simplified chemistry network with a more complicated, more complete PDR code um, to actually see how well is the simplified chemical network do in terms of getting all the chemical species right. Um, so in the end, uh, we proposed a simple and accurate network for hydrogen carbon chemistry in ISM. Um, this is based on the previous work of Nelson and Langer 1999 network. Um, we have a similar number of species and reactions, so the computational cost is quite similar. Um, we implemented this network in the code Athena++ with the CDODE package. We found that this is sort of the minimum network for simulating CO and H2 accurately uh, in a wide range of environments. Um, we have 18 species and 50 reactions. And this is an example of the comparison of the chemistry. So this shows that on the y-axis, the chemical abundances of different species as a function of column density from the cloud surface. So different colors are the different uh, chemical species as labeled here. So let's focus on CO, which is the magenta line. Um, the dashed line here shows the result from the PDR code, which is a benchmark of the right answer we want to match. Um, the solid line here shows the result from our chemical network, which um, agrees very well with the PDR code. And the dotted line here shows the Nelson and Lander 1999 network, which people have previously used in the literature. And we see we're doing a much better job to match the results from the PDR code, not only for CO, but for other chem chemical species as well. We have also done uh, similar comparisons of the chemical abundance at different densities. And this plot shows um, in, the, in the plane of the density versus column density, the, the transition for, of H2, um, H1 to H2 and C plus to C1 and C, C1 to CO. For example, if we look at um, the right part here that uh, marked by the magenta, line, magenta lines, and these are the regions where most <coughs> carbon are in the form of CO. So again, if we look at the PDR code, which is the right end, uh, quote, quote, right 
answer. Um, that is um, the dash line here. And then our network is the solid line, which agrees pretty well. <coughs> and that's an electric magnetic network would underestimate the CO abundance at this wide range of densities and column densities. Also, we have compared the time scales for H2 formation and the dynamical time. So if we assume that chemical reactions are in equilibrium, you would think that all these parts um, above this, the black lines are all in the form of molecular hydrogen. However, because the molecular hydrogen forms at a very long time scale compared to the uh, formation time scale of the cloud, um, they actually would not expect that there will be much molecular hydrogen in many of these uh, wide regions where the H2 formation time scale will be simply too long. And this suggests that um, the dynamics will be very important when considering the chemical composition, especially for H2. And then um, we go ahead and look at what this, in, uh, what this um, can tell us, what this imply for the um, chemistry in the molecular cloud. So this is sort of a easy plot. Um, let me explain a little bit. So on the right left, uh, left plot here, um, the lines are showing the contours of the abundance of H2, C plus, and CO. For example, above the black line here, all hydrogen are in the form of molecular hydrogen, and above the magenta line here, or C or carbon is in the form of CO. And the color scale shows the temperature, and the, um, and the red is for hot gas, and the blue is for cold gas. So we see that um, CO is not really a, a perfect trace of H2. The parts that's um, CO forming, um, is, uh, and the parts of H2 forming here, but only a small portion of it is actually forming CO. And also, CO and H2 actually traces the coldest gas, and each panel here shows a different metallicity, and even down to metallicity by 0.2, the SMC metallicity, you can still see that um, most coal gas are in the CO forming regions. And another question we can ask is whether mole molecules are necessary for low temperatures. So um, the way we do it is that we force the chemistry uh, to be actually different and kind of inconsistent um, with what we will get a typical densities and column densities just to see whether the heating and cooling is sensitive to chemistry. So starting with the fiducial model, we artificially removed CO, C1, and H2 to change the chemical compositions. However, we can see that the temperature, which is shown by the color scale, is not changing very much. So this says that um, gas temperature is mostly actually determined by the density um, and shielding, but not very sensitive to the chemical state. And this is because molecular gas um, actually forms at dense and shielded regions, um, and this coincidentally um, would be where the cold gas want to, want to reside as well. So it's more of a coincidence than a causal reaction for the molecular gas to be actually traced the coldest part of the ISM. And um, to validate our chemical network, we also compared our simulations um, with the observations. So here, symbols are from the observations of different sightlines in our galaxy, and the different color shows different chemical species. And for example, if we look at um, the magenta uh, lines and dots here, here are the observations um, of CO, and we can see that across uh, two orders of magnitude of H2 column density, our simulations can accurately um, reproduce the abundance of CO with the density between 100 and 1,000. And we also reproduce um, the cyan um, symbols here, which is CH, and the OH, blue symbols here is low to COH, which is encouraging because they are intermediate species to form CO, and this means we have captured the chemical pathways to form CO. However, um, there is one problem that we haven't solved, is the predicted abundance of carbon is too high, um, but you see this uh, red lines here, they lies mostly above um, this red uh, red dots and the, are the observations. So uh, this is still a puzzle, and we have tried several methods to see uh, which parameters could we use to actually solve these problems, and we found we didn't find a satisfactory solution. So um, the fiducial model here 
um, we have the CO2, C1 abundance to be too low, or, or in other words, the neutral carbon C1 abundance to be too high, then the observations here. Um, and, the, and then the only parameter that seems to change this ratio is the total carbon abundance. However, if you adjust the total carbon abundance to match the observations of C1, then when you look at observations of CH+, then the red lines um, lies in here, which are way above the observations. So this is sort of a dilemma that um, there's no um, parameters that we have found that actually can match the observations very well. Um, so this, this sort of suggests that either non-equilibrium chemistry has to affect the C1 abundance, or maybe there are some other chemical pathways that um, people haven't considered yet will affect the C1 abundance in the diffuse medium. So it's still quite a puzzle. And the summary for part one, um, we propose to implement a new lightweight and accurate chemical network um, for hydrogen and carbon chemistry um, in ISM. Um, we think that by time scale arguments, non equilibrium chemistry is potentially very important for the H2 formation. We found that gas temperature is not sensitive to the chemical composition of the ISM. And using 1D slab models, we can successfully reproduce the observed CO, CH, and OH abundances, but the predicted equilibrium C abundances is still too high. And then let's switch to part two, is to actually look at uh, some physical quantities um, in the interstellar medium. So what we are trying to study is this um, number called axial conversion factor. So what is the axial conversion factor? It's sort of an empirical number that translates observable CO luminosity that's written down here by WCO uh, to the physical column density of H2 that's written down on the left of NH2. And XCO is simply an um, empirical number that people get from observations. And um, the way to get um, the, X, the X number of X, the value of XCO in observations is to actually measure H2 directly independent of CO. So there are many methods to do that, including using zero mass methods, dust extinction or emission, or gamma ray. And we will do some uh, comparisons with the observations later as well. So if we um, cite the most uh, well-cited paper when people try to use the uh, number XCO, then um, what people usually do is they say that in the Milky Way, we recommend a version of XCO equals to 2 times 10 to the 20 with a plus minus 30% of uncertainty. And you will think this is not too bad because while well, plus minus 30% of uncertainty is very low by astrophysical standards. However, it's not really that simple. Um, we see a lot of variation actually in XCO for the, uh, for the molecular clouds in the Milky Way. So we found that XCO um, vary by a factor of 10 in different molecular clouds. Um, so this is a this is a, a very well-cited literature of observations of XCO, one of the earliest um, study of XCO, that you can see um, the value of XCO on the, X, on the Y axis vary by about order of magnitude, um, and it depends on the total CO luminosity of the cloud. And also, um, XCO is subject to observational uncertainties as well. For example, for the same Perseus molecular cloud, these two papers gave XCO value deferred by, most, uh, by almost a factor of 10. And this is because they have this, um, the different papers adopted different methods um, of dust to gas ratio, and they considered um, the different amounts of H2, H1 mass in their observations, and they deduced quite different results. So there's a, there's a large uncertainty in observations as well. And we know that there is a large variation of XCO in atrioclastic observations. So um, HCO depends on the metallistic in, and the environment that has been known and observed in many different galaxies. Um, however, it's, the specifics of how and why does uh, XCO do this is not really very well, un well understood. For example, if you look at observations, which are the gray um, dots here, um, there's a large scatter, but even if you but when you look at the theory, which are the different lines here, there was even a larger scatter, especially in the low metallicity regions. Um, the theoretical predictions is, is pretty uncertain. 
The reason why XCO value is so hard to determine is because CO is actually optically thick. Um, you see, a metaphor is just like inferring the mass of a building by just looking at the outside brick wall. So how does this work? So if you have a building um, and you try to look at the outside, you infer how much uh, mass it is inside. If you have similar buildings and what you are doing, you're just doing count how many buildings or clouds you have. So the total mass will be just proportional to the total numbers and just be proportional to the surface area or the CO emission that you observe. However, if you have um, buildings at different shapes um, and different um, colors, and like different clouds in different environments, then it's really hard to just judging from the optically thick emission from the outside of the cloud to see what actually was inside. Um, so ultimately, what we want to do is to have theory of simulations to be able to predict the value of XCO in different environments in order to guide observations. And luckily, there are many existing observations in the new QA for us to test the theory, and this is what we want to do here. So um, just to talk about our numerical method, so what we did is that um, we take a galactic disk observation um, from the Key Metal Striker 2016 paper called the Tiger Simulation. We process it with chemistry to get chemical abundances. And then we run the radiation transfer on top of it to get the CO emission, so we will have a synthetic observation map. And just um, to show what the Tiger's um, simulation looked like, um, so I'm going to show a movie, and different panels shows the different physical quantities. And I think we can just focus on the left panel, which shows the variation of density. Let's see what I can get it to play. So as the simulation goes, um, the stars form from the gravitational class of gas. Um, the yellow, dark yellow part is the dense gas, and the blue part is the less dense hot gas in the galaxy. And the supernova feedback will blow up these bubbles that you can see and create a very turbulent interstellar medium that you are seeing here. And the dense part um, will be the dense gas in the galaxy that we would think where stars will form, and this is where we want to study the molecular cloud formation. And for every simulation, there is a problem of um, whether the simulation is actually converged for the uh, numerical resolution that it has. So what we did is that we studied uh, three different resolutions for a 4 parsec, 2 parsec, to 1 parsec, increasing by a factor of 2. Um, and this shows that when we increase the resolution, there is more and more small scale structures that you see um, in a turbulent medium. And if you look at the bottom panel, which is the CO emission, you will also see there is more and more small scale structures. Uh, for all of the resolution, you will be able to resolve where the um, the location of the CO bright molecular cloud here, here and here. But for uh, 4 percent resolution compared to 2 percent, 1 percent, you will not be able to resolve the detailed structure of the molecular cloud, this sort of the filamentary structures that you see in the higher resolutions. And um, later, I will say indeed that you need at least 2 percent resolution to actually be able to resolve the, the average XCO in the molecular clouds. And what actually determines the XCO that um, we see in our galaxy? So XCO is simply the column density of H2 divided by the um, CO emission. And the column density of H2 kind of relates with the, um, to the density of the gas. And the WCO is mostly also determined by the temperature and the density. So um, if you have a typical observational line profile, the CO line profile, that is the CO brightness temperature versus velocity. Um, the WCO, which is the area below this line profile, is determined both by the peak of the line, the excitation temperature, and the um, width of the line, which is the velocity dispersion. In a typical molecular cloud observation, velocity dispersion doesn't vary um, very, very much. So this is have a velocity dispersion of about one to two kilometers per second. So WCO is mostly well correlated with the peak of the line and the excitation temperature. So if you just plug in some numbers of a typical density of the molecular cloud, <coughs> to be 
typical excitation temperature and the typical uh, velocity dispersion, then you get a number that's close to the Milky Way axial value. And then if you want to know what is the WCO in different pixels, um, then the uh, thing that uh, mostly determines the CO emission, it turns out to be density. So this shows the temperature of the gas and excitation temperature of the gas as a function of density. And we can see that as density increases, when the gas particles collide more often, the excitation temperature of CO is closer to the gas temperature and reaches equilibrium with the gas temperature where the temperature is a, the density is above a few thousand. Um, so because the blue CO correlates the best with the excitation temperature, it correlates very well with density as well. So this is what the next slide shows as a WCO distribution as a function of density and also column density. And we see that um, indeed WCO correlates very well with density and less well with the column density. This is because um, WCO is a direct measure of the excitation temperature um, which correlates directly with density and column density has a relation with WCO just because column density also has a correlation with mass weight to density. So we conclude that on parsec scales, the Lucio is actually more fundamentally a measure of mass weight to density rather than column density, although that's what people use to measure the X, um, for the, to measure the XCO. And also at least two parsec resolution is needed to resolve most of the CO emission. So if we look at um, the 1D histogram here, it's kind of obvious that um, the four parsec resolution simulations, which are the red lines here, has a very different distribution than the one parsec and two parsec simulations, which have um, a similar distribution and similar peak. This is because the one part, sorry, four parsec simulation cannot resolve the, the most of the dense gas in the galaxy and will not be able to resolve most of the CO emitting gas. And this leads to um, the question of the convergence of XCO. So if we want to know the average of XCO in a molecular cloud, and that is by some simple mass, is simply the average of XCO in each pixel weighted by WCO. So this is what um, I plotted here is the histogram of XCO weighted by WCO. And the peak here will be where um, the average XCO is. Again, we can see that one parsec and two parsec simulations can reproduce the peak um, of the XCO, can have a similar peak of the XCO in the distribution, but the four parsec simulation, um, because it cannot resolve much of the dense gas, um, it has a, a shifted higher peak in the simulation. So again, a resolution of two parsec uh, is needed to accurately determine the average XCO in the life. And then we compare the distribution of WCO to the um, observations. On the left here is our numerical simulation, on the right here is the observations. And we can see that the distributions are actually quite similar. Um, at a given AV, the extinction, there's a large dispersion of XCO, so the y-axis has a large dispersion. Um, however, the average value of WCO that is uh, marked by the magenta dots here um, is nearly, it has a nearly linear relation with um, the x-axis, the column density, um, or in other words, you have a nearly constant XCO across um, different, a constant average XCO across different AB. Um, this is quite encouraging that we can not only, not only reproduce the average XCO in the molecular cloud, but we can also reproduce the distribution of WCO when compared to observations. And we also have looked at um, the effect of non-equilibrium chemistry. Um, so the left and right plot here shows the abundance of the H2 and CO as a function of time. Um, we evolved the chemistry from 5 million years to 50 million years and to look at the change of chemical compositions. So we can see that they show a similar trend that the abundance of H2 and CO increases over time during, um, during the simulations. However, the abundance of H2 increases much more than CO. So if you look at, um, compare 5 million years to 50 million years, the abundance of H2 increased by a factor of 3. However, the abundance of CO only increased um, by about 30%. 
This is because um, we found that CO actually tends to form a denser gas than H2, and the CO abundance will reach its equilibrium faster than the H2 abundance because the chemical reaction time scale is much shorter for CO. And this would lead to lower XCO in younger clouds because your CO emission is not changing very much, whereas your H2 abundance um, is changing a lot over time. For younger clouds, you would expect a lower value of XCO. For example, when we compare the XCO value in the molecular cloud at 5 million years um, to the XCO value at 50 million years, they differ by about a factor of 2. We have also studied um, the different snapshots in our simulations to look at the variation of XCO um, in the different ISM evolutionary states. So actually what we found is a lack of um, variation of XCO. So now um, we're applying the value of XCO as a function of the average CO emission. And we can see that um, the CO emission varies by a factor of a few. However, the average XCO vary only by 30%. And there is a very, very weak relation here. And this is sort of the only relation we found in the simulations. We have looked at other quantities, for example, the average extinction in the molecular cloud or the FUV radiation fuel strength. And we also found a lack of um, correlation. And this is very similar to the trend that found in gamma ray observations that was recently done by the Fermi um, telescope. So the solid line here shows um, the observations, uh, the gamma ray observations. It has a steeper slope, but um, it has a similar sort of similar trend as we found in the simulations. Another thing that does change um, according to the galactic environment is the CO dark edge tube. So the, what is a CO dark H2? So we define it as um, the amount of H2 that's, uh, that is not emitting any CO, it's very, very faint in CO, divided by the total mass of the H2. So imagine <coughs> you have a molecular cloud, the dense part in the center have both CO and H2, and CO emitting, and the uh, outer region you have H2, but you don't have CO, so it's not CO emitting, and we will call this out part the CO dark H2. And then when we plot the fraction of CO dark H2, we found that it's correlated with the average extinction in the CO bright region. This is not surprising, sort of what you would expect naively, uh, because in more diffuse clouds on the left here, you would think there's less dense gas, so there will be less CO per H2, um, compared to, more, to denser clouds where there is uh, more, de more denser gas that um, will be variable for CO formation. So um, in our simulations, we found about 30 to 80% of H2 is CO dark at these um, parsec scale resolutions that we see. And also, there is more CO dark H2 in more diffuse clouds compared to um, desert clouds. And this is also what I've been found in Wolfirelog 2010 paper, the solid line here. And they used a semi-analytical model and found a similar trend. We further compare um, two observations, also look, to look at the FCO dependence on the visual extinction. So here, um, the colored lines and symbols here shows the dust-based observations of the nearby molecular cloud. For example, the magenta lines here are Orion, and the yellow line here um, is California. And the blue green line down here is the gamma ray observations. So there is a discrepancy already in the observations between dust-based observations lying on top and the gamma ray observations have a factor of a few lower axial line at the bottom corner. And our simulations are the black lines. So we, very interestingly, we can see that there is already a trend that we can pick up in the, um, in the observations that's similar to the simulations. So at the lower AV, uh, in some molecular clouds, you see this decline at the lower AV and the flatter profile at higher AV, and this is also what we saw in our numerical simulations. Um, and more interestingly, if you look at younger clouds in our simulations, the molecular cloud has a chemical evolution of only 5 million years instead of 15 million years, the profile looks quite different, and this is the dashed dotted line at the bottom. And we see that there's no decline at the beginning, 
and the profile sort of started rising, and this is generally flattered um, all in all. And very interestingly, when we compare the observations of California cloud, which is the yellow line here, this is thought to be a younger molecular cloud that have a lower star formation rate. It also has a similar profile um, to the younger molecular cloud in our simulations. So um, maybe this indicates that um, the profile of this XCO versus AV actually is, a, um, is an indicator for the age of the molecular clouds. Finally, um, um, a little bit more about the implication of the CO dark hash too. This actually have, uh, will affect um, the observed value of CO with different resolution in the observations. So what happens is that um, imagine you have a molecular cloud where the dense part are CO emitting and the less dense part are not CO emitting. If you have a higher resolution or smaller beam, you'll be able to pick out individual uh, parts of CO. Um, so there's more CO dark H2, which you would not count as the CO forming, CO emitting molecular cloud. However, if you increase your, uh, sorry, if you decrease your resolution or increase your beam size, um, then you would not be able to resolve the individual CO emitting part of the molecular cloud, and you would think the whole molecular cloud is CO emitting, and um, there will be less CO dark H2 in your observations. So this leads to the change of the value of back CO, uh, which is simply the um, total H2 mass divided by the total CO emission. Um, if you increase your beam size, then you accounted for more H2 mass. Although the total mass um, in physical mass is still the same in the galaxy, but you accounted more H2 in the CO emitting regions, um, therefore, you would have a higher value of XCO. And this is indeed what we have found um, in our numerical simulations. So we did an experiment of increasing the beam size in our synthetic observations, um, and we, sh we see that there is an increase of XCO uh, from, the from the beam size of a few parsec to a few hundred parsec. And the profile starts to be a little flutter, has some cutoff. Um, in the end, it's because when your beam size is too large, and sometimes you would not be sensitive enough to actually detect some of the diffuse CO emission um, in, in some environments. And um, this kind of so suggests for the same galaxy, um, if you can resolve the molecular cloud in, uh, in the different parts of the galaxy, compared to if you can resolve the molecular cloud, the XCO conversion factor will be differed by a factor of two. We tried to pick this out from uh, observations, but the scattering of the observations is very large, so it's pretty hard to see here. Oh, get stuck. See whether I can get it work. Oh, cool. So, um, um, so the summary part of um, the second part of my talk is about XCO. Um, to summarize it, we um, found that the XCO in the simulations have some properties that's quite similar to observations. We could reproduce the average value of XCO uh, as well as the um, variation of XCO on smaller scales. Our simulation also could um, reproduce um, the dependence of XCO on the excitation temperature um, and also extinction, um, what the trend was observed in the observations. And about 30 to 80 percent, sorry, I keep pushing this wrong, about 30 to 80 percent of XCO, sorry, H2 is CO dark, uh, which can lead to about a factor of two difference um, in XCO between the Milky Way and astrogalactic observations. So finally, I want to um, use the last 10, 15 minutes to thank everyone who has also um, helped me through my journey of my PhD. So first, um, I want to thank my advisor, of course, um, Eva Stryker. She's really, really wonderful to work with, and um, she just paid attention to so much details in which I just always remember how she would try to get everything right. Um, and she has supported me during the uh, most difficult time of my PhD of 
my job publication and um, a very depressing visa issues. Um, and it was <laughs> and it was great to have to have always have Eve on my back. And also my thesis committee, um, I had a great chat with them this morning. Um, they have been encouraging me uh, during my committee meeting the past four years, um, and they gave. Uh, me very like very useful suggestions uh, which I really really appreciated. Um, especially thank Mark who uh, we ended up writing a paper together and who traveled um, afar from Maryland to attend um, my thesis defense. Also, um, many many other research specialists um, in the scientific community. Um, the really awesome Athena Plus Plus team. Um, can go is here back here. And I learned a lot about programming with them, and it's really a pleasure to work um, with the C++ code. Um, it's just so, you know, so beautiful compared to some other code I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the TCAM members, especially um, this one, Chengu, he's a postdoc here. Um, he's sort of the technical person. I ask questions. And when I don't have the code working, I can't read the data, I can't run my Python script, and he will be always there helping me to solve my problems. Um, and also, my former advisors, just to show the picture, you might recognize this slide. Um, he's, uh, Doug Lin, he's gonna be here actually for his sabbatical very soon, so you will see more of him, maybe not dressed like this. Um, and also many other people in the larger scientific community, which I talk to either in the conferences or through email, um, that have encouraged me to pursue um, the science and also give me very valuable suggestions. Um, and of course, the paid and graduate students and postdoc and many of you who have already graduated um, encouraged me to uh, come here in the beginning or else I would never be here. Uh, Shani wrote me a really, really long email, <laughs> I remember. Uh, and a lot of them took me under their winds when I came. I didn't know, know anything. They got me started, um, which I'm very thankful about. And many of my friends here, um, you might see a lot of faces that not belong to this department. I had a really great fellow that they came for my thesis defense. A lot of them have already graduated. A lot of them will be graduating. Um, and uh, most, um, the community I'm most grateful about is the Princeton University Mountaineering Club. If you're not a member of, you should join. The president is here, <laughs> sitting right back. <laughs> and, um, um, and the association of the Chinese Student Association, we, all, we also go mountaineering or hiking as well. Um, and one special thank uh, this dude, <laughs> um, who uh, answered a, a lot of my existential crisis questions during our climate trip. Um, and also, I apologize to the ISST team if I delayed your um, scientific output because I took, <laughs> because I took Robert climbing. <laughs> and of course, this guy who has been here with me for five years. I can't imagine how many candles you can put in a birthday cake. Um, but um, he took me to many, many places. Um, uh, thank you, Kedron, and he taught me a lot of English, so if I have on grammar um, mistakes in this talk, it's all his fault. <laughs> but I'm very happy that we'll be able to go to Germany together, and hope I'll see a lot of you in Germany. And finally, um, I want to thank my family, my parents, uh, my aunt, and my cousin, who traveled across half of the earth um, to see my defense. I hope they're doing well in this uh, country they don't speak the language of, and um, hoping they're having a good time. And um, really, thank you a lot for your support, although I don't get to see you very much um, because I'm studying abroad. And finally, I just want to leave my conclusions and take any questions you have. So you said the, uh, the low temperature gas doesn't depend on metal risk that much. Is that because metal coating doesn't matter or just so overwhelming that um, in your range, no matter what metal risk, it's always cool? It depends a little bit. It's not, this, it's 
not nearly as sorry, it's, it's not quite nearly as sensitive as you would think. But it does depend on how someone is like on metallicity. So are you talking about this one? Or? Yeah, yeah. This one's not really metallicity, so um, I'll start with this one that you, you probably didn't ask. So this is metallicity from 0 0.2, 0 0.5 to 1. Uh, and then it, there is a difference in temperature. So for example, um, the shielded gas here is, has a higher temperature in low metallicity regions because the cosmic ray heating does not depend on metallicity, but the gas cooling depends on metallicity. Um, however, the less shielded gas here is not very sensitive to metallicity because both the heating and the cooling depend on metallicity, so they sort of cancel it out. And the dependence is not as it's not very much. And this one is not really metallicity. It's the same metallicity. It's just a uh, different chemical composition. Um, so I, I just hand forced um, CO or C1 or H2 to not form by setting the formation rate to be zero in the chemical network. So it's, it has a similar temperature because um, sort of by chance, CO, C1, and C plus has a similar cooling rate um, at these very low temperatures. And also, um, mostly when you get to these high shielded, when you get to these shielded regions, the the heating by the UV radiation is reduced as well. So that leads to the that is um, a big reason why it leads to the low temperatures. So the chemical composition does not really affect the gas temperature um, as much as you would think. Thank you. Other questions, Jeremy? This. Uh Atomic carbon problem. Uh, have you tried playing with the reaction rates, uh, particularly the grain reaction rates? Yeah. Um, so, oh. so uh, Bruce suggested this morning. One thing one can consider is perhaps carbon uh, carbon plus will stick to the grains and not return as a neutral carbon, so you would not have a much more hot gas based neutral carbon. Um, I tried to play with several things, um, but none of them really quite worked. Um, for example, the CH, um, for the CH abundance, I tried to sort of inject a reaction uh, for the CH plus reaction, but some people think um, that because in some turbulent um, part there will be heating in local part in the turbulent. Um, ISM, and then you have a high formation rate of CH plus, um, but this doesn't really work for some other reasons I can explain to you later. So I tried kind of sort of several similar things. The only thing I think it might work, I haven't tried yet, but Bruce just suggested that maybe uh, the carbon will stick on the grains. Yeah. Um, on the same carbon thing, uh, yeah. I missed whether it was some peculiarity of your model or all PDR models? It's all PDR models. Um, so, so it wasn't some. It wasn't. Thing it wasn't this out. one. So, for example, um, the the original paper that had these observations, they compared to the PDR code by um, Black and um, Edwin Van I can't pronounce it. Um, and that has the same problem. And um, some other PDR code have the same problem. I looked into the literature. It seems to be. Other questions? So a question on the computation side. So mm -hmm. you said two passes is good. So I mean, presumably the market gas form out of cold neutral gas. So mm -hmm. there's hierarchy of things coming down. Mm -hmm. Is two two passes is just for sustaining market class, or it's the forming from the hierarchy downward? Um. So <laughs> the the reason why two parsec is not really. It's good for some things, not really good enough for other things. So it's good enough for detecting most of the CO emission. And the reason why is that the CO emission, um, the CO, CO um, 12, 1, 2, 0 emission, more specifically, um, it's optically thick in most cases, and it comes from uh, mostly in the, gas, um, in, in the gas that has a density range of a few hundred. Um, 
So that you can resolve with a certain resolution about two parsec. So if you um, if you want to look actually want to look at the chemical abundance of CO, which um, it's different from the emission because the emission is something you think. A lot of chemical, um, a lot of CO abundance can be hidden in the denser part of the cloud that you cannot see in the two two in the in the one two zero emission. Um, then you actually need a higher resolution to resolve the total chemical abundance. And if you use another line, um, like if you use CO two to one, which has a lower up to the depth, you would need a higher resolution. But I think in a turbulent medium, if you only care about um, like the total CO emission, then of CO CO one two zero um, twelve twelve CO emission, then that will be enough. Um, but it's very specific to to this case. It's mostly a density argument. Well, if there's no more questions, let's thank Moon on again. And we will be moving across the hall for uh, a little first-hand celebration. <laughs>